I'm here at the University of Minnesota exploring the soul of Western civilization. The DNA of the Western civilization was written in the universities and monasteries in Europe. Now the universities have rejected the ideas that created the modern West. Therefore, in a series of lectures, I'm exploring if the sun must now set on the West. I've never lived in Minneapolis. Um, last Sunday, as I was walking to see the collapsed bridge, I found that you had a waterfall here. And then I actually realized that um, the city of Minneapolis grew up because of that waterfall 150, 160 years ago as European travelers came here and saw that waterfall, they realized that that energy of water falling can be harnessed and sawmills and flour mills can be built here. And uh, they went ahead and began to do that. As a result, uh, Minneapolis became the flour capital of America for a period of 50 years or so. Now that's something which is very much uh, like what the Leonardo da Vinci would have done, would have seen the potential immediately and would have devised machinery to do exactly that. As you walk around and see those mills and see those bridges and universities and banks and uh, financial institutions that invest and the law firms the commerce that is going on all around us here, you also see hundreds of buildings that are either churches or church-related institutions, schools, colleges, university, um, hospitals, literacy programs. I was amazed how many uh, church-related buildings there are in, in downtown, even though they are being dwarfed by these other uh, giant uh, skyscrapers. Is there a relationship between the faith that was being taught in these churches and the water mills and the sawmills and the banks and the commerce and the industry? That is the question for today. You know, let, let's imagine Minneapolis doesn't exist. This is still a pristine area. Nobody has seen the only waterfall in Mississippi River. And let's imagine these university graduates from France and Italy and Israel and California uh, had come here only in the 1980s and 1990s. Would they have attempted to put up water mills or would they have tried to make some huts for meditation playing a Nirvana album uh, from Kurt Cobain? and dancing and waiting for extraterrestrials to come to this beautiful psychic centers to give enlightenment to us. And that's what they did at the Niagara Falls when they believed uh, that uh, the new age was about to dawn. Let's sit there, let's meditate, let's use our psychic energies to communicate with the extraterrestrials and begin a new age. Uh, not thinking of using that water power to create the kind of industry and wealth and commerce and businesses uh, that were created the city of Minneapolis. Now, I want to suggest that what happened here in Minneapolis is uniquely Western. In 1968, the Beatles went to India to a much bigger waterfalls and a lot more beautiful and scenic place than Minneapolis, which is Rishikesh and Haridwar. And they financed a building of a whole ashram, uh, the retreat center for the Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, the guru who brought transcendental meditation. 
They funded a building in which I sat down in the living room of the Mahesh Yogi and took initiation into transcendental meditation. So we had these waterfalls and rivers and scenic spots, but our sages, brilliant, dedicated, keen minds, never used that water power to create the kind of industry that you created here. They worshiped the river, they worshiped the waterfall, they sought enlightenment there, they meditated, and as by sitting too long, their backs began to ache, they created exercises like yoga, uh, which, uh, which were very helpful. You know, 50 years ago, everybody in America worked, walked, at least to the bus stop, train station, chopped woods, and you didn't need the exercises. Um, but now you do because lifestyle has changed. In India, uh, everybody worked throughout the ages except for the people who were seeking enlightenment and they were the ones who needed the exercise because they didn't otherwise get any exercise. So they developed yoga and they had the time. I mean, when you sit for 12 hours at the computer, you don't have the time to develop good exercises, but they did and integrated those in their search for mystical enlightenment, something that we will look at today. From the 1850s and 60s when Minneapolis was founded to the days of the Beatles and Kurt Cobain and Dan Brown, and we'll focus briefly on him, is the sun setting on the West? That's the overarching question for this series. Uh, last week we looked at from Bach to Cobain, and today from uh, Da Vinci to uh, Dan Brown. Da Vinci here stands for life of reason, life of the mind, and Dan Brown for a move towards myth and mysticism, very much what happened on the banks of the rivers and waterfalls in my country. Is that where the West is moving? and what are the reasons for that move, and what are the consequences of that move. The question obviously is, what made the West a uniquely thinking civilization? Last week we were asking, what made the West a uniquely musical and optimistic civilization, both Bach and Cobain lost their parents when they were nine year old. Now, Bach's parents died, Cobain's parents divorced. And that was devastating experience for a young boy. But Bach was able to celebrate suffering, the passion of St. Matthew or St. John, because he found a faith in resurrection that God is uh, very much there. He loves this world and is engaged in saving this fallen, lost world. So he was able to participate in that whole tradition of joy to the world, of come all you faithful, joyful, and triumphant in the face of suffering and evil. But Cobain didn't have that faith in the living God. Uh, he believed that ultimate reality is nothingness. Unfortunately, nothingness does nothing. So there was no reason to celebrate music then became an anguished scream, uh, abuse uh, of frustration, despair. Uh, although he became a Buddhist, called his band Nirvana, uh, Buddhism itself didn't develop a tradition of music because Buddhists were seeking silence, how to silence your mind and how to silence your thoughts. Now the same is the case here as we examine this move, a cultural shift from Da Vinci to Dan Brown. Da Vinci, in his notebooks where he writes about everything that he is doing and his reflections, he states in the very early parts his commitments to three things. One is empirical experience. He calls experience his mistress, that he is wedded uh, to empirical experience, um, uh, observation, because you want to understand nature. So he's studying anatomy, he's studying birds, 
he is studying human body, he is observing facts carefully, he is just before the scientific revolution, but he is part of the flowering of the renaissance uh, where people have a deep interest in nature which is being driven from uh, the point of view that we are supposed to understand nature, we are created to understand nature and govern nature, rule over nature, establish our dominion over nature. So uh, we, we have the intellectual faculties, our rationality is given to us so that we might understand and establish our dominion over nature. He died in 1519, which is just two years after Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the uh, church uh, in Wittenberg. So he just the dawn of the Reformation is when uh, Leonardo da Vinci dies. His second passion is to study what he calls instrumental or mechanical arts. He was a sculptor, he was a painter, he was an architect, uh, he was many things. But he says of all the arts, the mechanical arts or engineering is the most important and most useful. So this is uh, still the middle ages before the start of the modern era. Uh, he is devising all kinds of machines and his interest in human body, his interest in the study of birds, and he designs helicopter and tank, etc. Uh, because uh, he is uh, studying uh, mechanical arts and he finds this most, uh, most useful, most important part of what he does. And his third commitment is to mathematics. The reality, the universe is mathematical. Eventually modern science is born with Galileo and particularly with Newton who come to believe that the laws of nature are written in the language of mathematics and uh, mathematics is the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe and establishing our dominion over the universe. So the rationality of uh, the universe as mathematical rationality, this is what da Vinci stands for in his own mind, a commitment to empirical observation which he calls experience through eyes and ears and touch, etc., mechanical engineering or instrumental arts and mathematics. But da Vinci, who was committed to rationality in the hands of Dan Brown, becomes a figure who represents myths and mysticism. The book is called the Da Vinci Code because Dan Brown is saying that in the paintings of Leonardo da Vinci, there are secret messages uh, encoded. His focus is on uh, the painting of the Last Supper. Uh, he's arguing that in the Last Supper, there is no chalice. And the apostle next to Jesus Christ, who is uh, sort of creating a V-shape, the way their bodies are leaning, is in fact a woman, it's not John, which uh, is what uh, Leonardo writes in his own notebook, uh, this is John. It's not John, it's a feminine figure and it's Mary Magdalene. She is the center of the, of the Last Supper. Uh, so what? Well, he's saying that there is no chalice because she is the chalice. To be more specific, what he's saying is that her vagina is the chalice. That's what Jesus gives to the 12 apostles. So the Last Supper is in fact a sexual ritual. So what's the blood that he gives? It is her blood, menstrual blood, which was part of the sexual ritual in some of the Gnostic sects, uh, which were very much part of the early Christianity, which was suppressed by the Roman Catholic Church. This is what the Holy Communion was all about and that is what Leonardo da Vinci was participating in and those secret sects have continued and are very much part of uh, um, secret sects but they have to be secret otherwise the popes would kill them.
Now, there is a lot of truth in what Dan Brown is saying. In the uh, book of Revelation in the New Testament, there's letters to seven churches. At least three of those seven churches have sexual rituals as part of their religiosity. One of them is commended, one of the churches commended that uh, they can't tolerate this wickedness. Two of the churches are warned uh, to uh, stay away from these kinds of uh, wickedness and evil. But what we have always known is that as Christianity moves out from Jewish uh, setting into the pagan setting, there are temples with thousands of uh, temple prostitutes. So religious sex is very much part of the cultural environment in which the church begins to grow. And as those people are converted, they come into the church and some of those women who have been uh, practicing uh, sexual uh, rituals in the temples that's the only livelihood they have. And when they become Christian and find no other means of living, they bring some of those traditions, some of those beliefs and values into the church. And the church is in fact resisting that, uh, not in a power struggle in order to suppress women, but because these rituals and this religiosity, this perversion was what was enslaving and destroying pagan world as we read in Romans 1 and in other passages of the New Testament. So Christianity does uh, suppress uh, that expression of sexuality, that New Testament sexuality is something which is intended to make a man and a woman one in a permanent relationship, uh, to have children and uh, to raise godly families. This is something that we will talk about in another lecture, uh, but uh, the point is, that Dan Brown is saying that these things were present in early Christianity, and he's right. But he would like to revive those today. That's where the problem is, and he is trying to uh, argue that this is what uh, Leonardo da Vinci really stands for. But the fact is that Leonardo da Vinci doesn't paint the cellist in that painting of the Last Supper because his painting is very biblical. In the Bible, there is no cellist. The cellist is part of a European myth, uh, the quest for the chalice. Every disciple in the painting does have his cup. So Jesus is saying that drink this cup as any Jewish family during Passover will have. Each one will have their own cup. That's what uh, the, the painting has. But the important thing is that myth is a myth and it doesn't have to be historical truth. The West has moved from the age of reason to the age of non-reason, the age of myth and mysticism and particularly sexual mysticism which is what is raising the question, must the sun now set on the West? Because Western civilization advanced over all the other civilizations because the West cultivated its rationality and reason in a unique way. You know, we are here in the University of Minneapolis and university is a uniquely Western institution. The question is, why did the West become a uniquely thinking civilization, a rational civilization? Uh, seven years ago at the turn of the millennium, many scholars and historians were telling us that the West became a thinking civilization because of an incidental invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in Germany. He created the press, printing became easily available, books became cheaper, people started reading, and therefore the West became a rational thinking civilization. The problem with that analysis or interpretation is that the same scholars were also telling us that printing existed in China 500 years before Gutenberg. 
and at least 200 years before Gutenberg, the Koreans had invented movable metal fonts. In fact, by the 9th century, the Chinese had printed 130,000 pages of Buddhist scriptures called Tripitaka. Some of those temples had so many books that they had to invent rotating bookcases. And these rotating bookcases was a technological innovation because flywheel didn't exist in those, those days. In the middle of the 12th century, a, Ch a Chinese Buddhist monk traveled through eastern China and he wrote in his travelogues that as you go into these monasteries and temples, in 60 to 70 percent, you can hear the sound of rotating bookcases 24 hours a day. So here are these temples and monasteries and you can hear the sound of rotating bookcases. So you would imagine that here are monks who are far more dedicated to scholarship than the students at the University of Minnesota. You know, day and night they are going in, pulling out books, reading them, putting them back. That's a tremendous academic scholarly activity is happening there. But in fact, that's not what was happening. Monks were rotating these bookcases and they were meditating on the sound of the rotation. They believed in salvation through rotation, <laughs> which was the same idea of the uh, mechanical flags, uh, mechan mechanical prayer wheels. What they were trying to do was turn the sound of those sacred books rotating into a mantra. <laughs> mantra is opposite of word. Word is sound with sense. Mantra is sound without sense, sound from which sense has been deleted. So originally the words may have meaning, but when politicians begin, begin to repeat them and repeat them and repeat them, they lose all their meaning, you still repeat them, not only politicians but also clergymen, you can repeat those words and they lose all their sense. Now why were they not reading the words and meditating on the words, I mean, thinking about uh, the text, but uh, spending 24 hours a day meditating on the sound. The reason for that was that the Buddha believed that the ultimate reality is not a personal God. God hasn't created this universe, a personal, rational being who is logos, or who is word. The Greeks used the term logos to refer to the spoken word as well as the word in the mind. It is sense, logic, reason. So uh, the Gospel of John begins by saying in the beginning was logos, in the beginning was the word the Word was with God, the Word was God. It can be translated as in the beginning was reason, or logic, reason was with God, reason was God. This re rationality created everything and this Word, this sense became flesh and dwelt amongst us as Jesus Christ, the Word incarnated. If a rational personal God has not created this universe, he does not exist, then what is at the source of this universe? If rationality is not there, then Buddha believed that primeval ignorance is the ultimate source of creation. He called it avidya. Avidya or ignorance is at the root of all creation. He had the theory of dependent origination of 12 steps of creation or 12 steps of devolution. Everything including human consciousness and human mind is a product of ignorance. Therefore, mind cannot be a means of knowing truth. 
words, logic, thought can have nothing to do with truth because truth is not rational. There is no personal rational God or ultimate being. So, how do you know the truth? You know the truth through killing your mind, silencing your thoughts, your words. When you can uh, stop thinking, then you will have a mystical illumination or enlightenment or experience. Now, the person who uh, brought the philosophy behind Dan Brown's uh, Da Vinci Code uh, most powerfully uh, to America was Acharya Rajneesh. Uh, Rajneesh was a Hindu philosopher who studied philosophy in India, taught philosophy in India, became a guru. At first he was Acharya, which means guru. Later he became Bhagwan, which means God, finally as Osho. And you might remember, those of you who are a little older would remember that he had a ranch in uh, Oregon, Rajneesh Puram, with uh, his devotees donated him about 90 Rolls Royces. Uh, he became very famous for that. Uh, he was constantly in trouble with the law for fake marriages, drug, uh, this, that, and the other. He was in trouble in India. That's why he came here, got into trouble here, had to choose between jail or deportation. He chose uh, uh, to go back to India and eventually probably died of uh, HIV AIDS. But um, he, he was the one who began uh, teaching uh, salvation through sex is one of the most famous, well-known, controversial books it was called From Sex to Superconsciousness. And uh, a lot of sexual mystical rituals were taught and are still taught in his ashrams much before Dan Brown, he argued vigorously that Jesus taught salvation through sex. When the two become one flesh, that's when you are born again. This was one very important message that he kept repeating, that the way to be born again is for two, male and female, to become one flesh, transcend your finiteness of being male and being female. The impact of his teachings is very much part of the philosophical wing of homosexuality and radical feminism. A lot of it ha has come from Rajneesh, but the interesting thing was that as a philosopher, he had also become a skeptic, both Rajneesh and uh, Krishnamurti, two Indian thinkers who had profound impact on America. Uh, they were the ones who, as philosophers, would really say, follow me for I don't know the way which is really what every professor in American University is saying. That's what skepticism is all about, that the skeptic as the cultural authority is saying, you should follow me, but I don't know the way. I don't know the truth. I know that I don't know the truth, and I know that I can't know the truth, uh, but follow me. And how did we come to this, and how skepticism leads to mysticism, the move from Da Vinci to Dan Brown, the road goes through skepticism. And this is a serious issue because not only were uh, historians and sociologists uh, at the turn of the millennium misleading us that the West became a thinking civilization because of the printing press, they were also saying, and they keep saying, that the West became a uniquely rational civilization because of the Greeks. Now, Greeks in 6th century before Christ, beginning with people like philosophers like Thales or Thales, they indeed cultivated a thriving life of the mind. So, uh, the Greeks did experiment with rationalism. And in order to do that, they had to assume that Logos is the ultimate reality. So the idea of there being logic, there being Logos uh, at the source of the universe did in fact uh, originate with the Greeks. And th you have to believe that if you want to believe in the validity of human reason, human rationality. But the problem was, where does the Logos reside? Where does logic live? 
why is there logic in the universe? So Plato had to is assume or imagine, the Greek philosopher Plato, uh, that there is a realm of ideas, just there is a realm of the material universe, there is a realm of ideas in which uh, logic, logos, resides. But that was essentially an imaginary world, although in Plato that was the real world, uh, the material world is the world of shadows. The Greeks were never sure, but Greeks had an additional problem. The sophists who use rhetoric the most, they eventually forced everybody to doubt logic and logos. In Greek city-states, uh, there were democracies on and off, and democracy depends on persuasion. So two parties are arguing several parties are arguing and each one is presenting his case with tremendous logic and trying to persuade others. But if logic can be used equally effectively by different speakers, each presenting his case which is mutually exclusive and each sounding very logical, then can logic lead us to truth? because each one of them is logical and they are mutually exclusive. So people began to think that logic has something to do with rhetoric or art of persuasion, but it has nothing to do with the truth. It's not an instrument of knowing truth. It's an instrument of manipulation, which is very much what postmodern deconstructionists would say that it is about having power over others, persuading others, it's not a search for truth. So Greeks began to give up their confidence in logos and skepticism developed in Greeks which led to the end of Greek rationalism, Greek science, Greek philosophy. Now at first, Skepticism is part of rationalism. Skepticism, doubt or questioning, believes that if I doubt a statement, if I examine it carefully with rigorous, trenchant, sharp thinking, careful thinking, we can arrive at truth. So rationalism believes that human mind can know truth. Skepticism says that let's not be gullible, let's be very careful in the use of reason and careful use of reason will lead us to truth. So initially skepticism was part of rationalism and skepticism was part of the quest for truth, part of philosophy. And an important side issue which we won't develop, the implication of it is that in Greece, logic had no relationship with religion. Religion was based on myth. Philosophy was independent of religion. Uh, rationalism was part of philosophy. But 300 years before Christ, when Alexander the Great, who was protege of Aristotle, he ran into some naked Indian ascetics who were Buddhists and Alexander had taken two philosophers with him. One was Pyro, the skeptic. And as Pyro began interacting with these Buddhist philosophers, his relative skepticism became absolute skepticism. Because these Buddhist monks persuaded him that, look, how can your logic, rationality lead you to truth? Because your mind, your logic, your rationality is product of avidya, is product of ignorance. How can something which is product of ignorance lead you to enlightenment? So Pyro went back to Greece, started his school of skepticism, demolished Greek confidence in Logos, Greek rationalism died. Greek rationalism has nothing to do with West becoming a rational civilization. 
it had ended with the end of Plato's Academy in Athens. Saint Augustine was a teacher of Greek philosophy and he was struggling with these sects and heresies like the kind Dan Brown describes uh, in his book. They were part of the New Testament or the early uh, Christianity, but he concluded that no, God has spoken to us, he has revealed, he's given us his word as he started reading the Bible. You know, he lived the kind of life Dan Brown would, uh, would want us to live. By the time Augustine was 15, he already had a mistress. But, but then as he began reading the Bible, he realized that no, this is the word that really answers questions that Greek philosophy cannot adequately answer. Do I exist? Yes, I can exist because God exists and he made me in his image. Does my reason have validity? Yes, if God is a rational personal being who made me in his image. Then my intellect is valid. Words can in fact communicate truth. He began to believe in revelation. He then wrote the curriculum for education in Europe and for a thousand years or so, it was Augustinian curriculum that was taught in Europe, which developed in schools. Now, the middle of the 12th century, when this Buddhist philosopher tra travels in Eastern uh, uh, China and sees the monks meditating on the sound of rotating bookcases, that's the time when monasteries in Europe such as Oxford and Cambridge and Cathedral School in Paris, they are turning into universities. And what is a university? University is institutionalization of the life of mind. So you have two different worldviews. The worldview which Dan Brown would like to propagate and the biblical worldview that created the universities. You know, when the Puritans come here within 16 years of arrival in New England, they establish Harvard to cultivate the life of the mind. They pass a law that any town that has 50 households should have appointed teacher, otherwise the town will be fined. Education is important. Cultivating the mind is important because God is rational. Our mind is made in His image. So to be godly, we must cultivate our mind. This, this begins to drive the Western civilization. But another outlook which sees ultimate reality is avidya, which is at the root of this universe. Our mind, the product of ignorance, mysticism, wants to kill the mind and thought and silence it. Having rejected this personal creator, rational creator, the West is being forced also to reject rationality, mind, words, and seek experience of altered state of consciousness through drugs, through meditation, through physical exercises, through sexual exercises, through homosexuality, etc. And this is what is raising the question, must the sun set on the West? Rationalism is alive. Practically every professor at one level would be a rationalist. But important point is that rationalism has become pessimistic. Rationalism began as an optimistic epistemology, an optimistic belief that human mind without God's help, without revelation, can know truth. The human mind is sufficient to know the truth, but that optimism that human mind can know the truth by itself without God's revelation, that has collapsed. Descartes tries to prove that he exists and God exists and other philosophers by the time of David Hume, for example, he proves that logic cannot prove God. 
Now, does that mean that God doesn't exist or does it mean that logic is limited? The rationalist said, well, we're not going to believe whatever logic cannot prove. So if logic can't prove God, let's forget God. The important thing is to be moral. So Hume himself became a moral philosopher that let's no morality, let's know right and wrong. But then Immanuel Kant came along and showed that actually human logic cannot know reality as it really is. Whether ultimately the universe is moral, we cannot know. But nevertheless, we should believe in morality. So Kant himself taught categorical imperatives that we should believe in, in morality, even though we can't prove whether the universe is moral. Nietzsche came along and said, this is rubbish. He was still a rationalist that morality is only an attempt by the weak, the poor, the meek, to try and control, restrain the powerful, the Aryans in Germany. So let's get rid of this uh, morality business. So you can't know God, you can't know morals. Well, uh, Alexander Pope, uh, the humanist poet, he had already said, the important thing is not to know God, but to know man. Know then thyself, presume not God to scan, for proper study of mankind is man. But then Sigmund Freud came along and said that actually reason cannot know self. Reason can know the conscious self, but consciousness is tip of the iceberg. The real mind is the unconscious. It expresses itself in um, dreams, in under hypnosis, in slip of the tongue, in psychosomatic diseases, etc. But it's not rational, therefore rationality cannot know the subconscious. So you, reason can't know God, reason can't know morals, reason can't know man. Well, reason at least can know nature. Sure, science is unraveling the mysteries of nature. Then Heisenberg came along in the 1920s and said, when you go into physics and quantum mechanics, uh, you hit a glass ceiling beyond a point the structure of the physical universe doesn't correspond to the structure of human consciousness. It's not logical according to our logic. So we can't know material universe. That raised the question, then what is language? What are words? And that's where the modern deconstruction, you know, beginning with Wittgenstein's uh, linguistic analysis, what is language? Does it have anything to do with truth? And then the Western philosophy arrived at the conclusion that words have nothing to do with truth. They are only means for manipulation, which is what the average university would teach. You know, when a young man says to you, I love you, don't believe him, he simply wants to go to bed with you. The child cries when he wants to move his mother to give him milk. When he grows up, he begins to use words. Words are only means of Manipulation, they have nothing to do with truth. What is logic? Is it universal? Is it part of the universe? You don't see that in subatomic level. Well, everything is a cultural construct in postmodernism. Logic is a construct of Western culture. Aristotle invented it, Bothius brought it into the church, uh, Hegel changed some of the rules. Um, but it has no universal validity. So, down with the left brain, up with the right brain, intuition, mysticism, channeling, that became the mantra of the New Age movement with Mer Marilyn Ferguson, etc. So, rationalism continues, but it has no hope of knowing truth. So it's pessimism, it's despair. If we are to know truth at all, it will be as we kneel before the bones of Mary Magdalene in Paris. Yeah, yeah. That's when we will know the truth. <laughs> when we find the fine chalice. Once uh, confidence in reason is gone, um, then the mysticism comes back. You can't live as a skeptic because you still have to have answers. Logic is gone, myth comes back. So 
most of the religions all over the world were based on myths, including Greek religions were based on myth. W once the Western confidence in reason disappeared, then people like Joseph Campbell uh, became very popular that myths is what we need. So George Lucas created a new myth. So he yeah. said, okay, uh, he started creating the myth, but uh, his myth of the Jedi is appeals to teenagers. What about university professors? They need Langdon. <laughs> the sexual mysticism is more appealing, uh, but um, George Lucas can't have sexual mysticism and sell PG rated films. Um, so you need, you need something more as you grow up. So you're back to the Greek Roman um, Gnostic uh, era in Europe, but that has been dead for 2000 years. So Tantric Buddhism and Tantric Hinduism, which the hippies discovered in uh, Himalayan caves, uh, ashrams, that becomes more appealing. So Dan Brown is giving myth to adults, while George Lucas is giving myths to the young people. Common sense is collapsing in, in America, because after Hume, when philosophers realize that reason cannot lead us to truth, a Scottish philosopher, Thomas Reed, tried to create an enlightenment myth called common sense. The classic statement of common sense in America is the preamble to the Constitution that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, unfortunately, equality is not self-evident. Inequality is self-evident. Now, my ancestors were not stupid, but they never saw human beings as equal. Some were high caste, some were low caste. Women certainly were lower than men. Inequality is scientific, empirical fact. It is observable, even in America. American women launched the women's lib movement because they experienced themselves as un unequal. The blacks launched the civil rights movement because they experienced themselves as unequal. Inequality is self-evident, observable, scientific fact. The real philosophical question is, why are human beings unequal? Indian tradition answered the question with the theory of karma and reincarnation. Souls are born unequal because of their karma in previous life. To people like Jefferson and Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin, etc., human beings appeared equal and common sense appeared self-evident. There is some res platonic reservoir of common sense from which is self-evident, visible to everybody. You can draw uh, morality from there. Uh, you don't need revelation. But that was an enlightenment myth on which America was built. But common sense was a shadow of the biblical worldview. The Bible was the reality, common sense was a shadow. As America is rejecting the Bible, common sense is disappearing, has to disappear. Racism has to come back, as it did in Germany. To some friends of mine, it's common sense that marriage should be one man, one woman. To their children, it is common sense that their parents are bigots, secular bigots. Uh, marriage is about love, what has it got to do with gender? Common sense is cultural creation. So what was common sense for 200 years was in fact biblical culture, even if the deists rejected the Bible. All that was built on common sense was in fact built on the shadow of the Bible, including science and technology. So must the sun set? Must the whole moral, uh, social, cultural uh, structure of Western civilization collapse? No. There is no need to despair. The problem with 
the rationalism which led to skepticism was that it assumed that we have eyes, therefore we can see the world. I have eyes, I can see the world, why do I need God's help? I have mind, I can know the truth, why do I need revelation? Well, the fallacy with that is that you can have not two, but two million eyes. Eyes see nothing without the light. Eyes are dependent on the light. Eyes need light to see anything. Mind by itself cannot know anything. Mind needs illumination of revelation. This is what Augustine discovers, that yes, human mind is valid, human words are valid, but not by itself. By itself, it does lead to radical skepticism and then attempts to annihilate the mind, kill the mind through psychotechnologies, through meditation, through mysticism, including sexual mysticism. But we, we are not reduced to that because there really is a God who is not silent. He created us to communicate because He wants to communicate and He has communicated, He has revealed Himself to us. Therefore, human mind has validity. Therefore, we need to cultivate our minds in order to know God, in order to be human, to establish our dominion over this earth, which created this civilization. So in the Middle Ages, before Leonardo da Vinci, the Western church already was creating a uniquely rational man, where a young man went into the monastery to get to know God. He was studying logic as his means of knowing divinity. So you went to the seminary, you went to monastery, you studied logic, philosophy, rhetoric, uh, literature, scriptures, theology, philosophy, to know God. So the West began creating a peculiarly rational man in the Middle Ages because of this worldview, a rational man who was capable of developing capitalism, which is represented all over downtown Minneapolis with these banks and investment firms. So. What made the West a uniquely thinking, rational civilization? It was this worldview that the universe is created by a personal, rational being whose image we are. And in order to know God and to become godly, we need to cultivate our mind. That idea is what is lost and the consequence of that loss is the setting sun. Thank you very much. These lively interactions with students, faculty and community at the University of Minnesota have reinforced my faith that there is no reason for the West to amputate its own soul. A recovery of faith is possible and desirable. The sun need not set on the West.